Okay, so I decided to break this up into multiple videos, but I'm going to keep going. So this is lecture 33. The last one was lecture 32. I may have said 31 in the video. I'm sorry, I hope it's not too confusing. Um, in this lecture, which will be a little bit shorter, I'm going to talk about um, the initiation of substance use and focus on predisposing factors and the process through which alcohol, or sorry, any substance use is precipitated. Okay, so here's our ideological model of substance use disorder. Um, for the homework reading for this lecture, you're going to read articles about cultural attitudes, substance availability, and most importantly, economic marginality as environmental predisposing factors for substance use. Um, this article will be in the context of the 1980s crack panic, but as you're reading it, I want you to think about the um, readings on deaths of despair during the 2000s opioid epidemic. Um, and think about how the cultural attitudes, the availability of substances, and the experience of economic marginality that's being felt by rural working class people now is similar to that being felt by Black people in cities in the 80s. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to touch a little bit on other predisposing factors, including genetically um, mediated physiological responses to substances and personality traits, as well as family history and how these things interact with each other. The focus, the main focus of today's lecture is going to be the interaction of temperament, so predisposing factors and cognitive factors, expectancies, beliefs about the effects, desirability of substances. Um, we'll talk more about perpetuation in the final lecture, um, but as a reminder, we already touched on conditioned functional and metabolic tolerance and withdrawal as longer term perpetuating factors that drive continued use despite problematic consequences. Okay, so who is at risk for substance use disorder? We know that substance use disorder is very heritable. Um, about 40 to 60% of the variability in substance use in the population is accounted for by people's genes. We know this partly through adoption studies where the children of biological parents with substance use disorders who are adopted into families where there's no substance use or no problematic substance use are still four to eight times more likely to have substance use disorders than their peers or than their adopted siblings from families that don't have this history of substance use disorder. Interestingly, most of these studies find that the heritability is to substance use disorder in general. It's not specific to certain substances. So if an adopted child had a parent with alcohol use disorder, that child's not just at increased risk for alcohol use disorder, they're at increased risk for substance use disorder in general. So cannabis use disorder, opioid use disorder, stimulant disorder, and alcohol use disorder. So we've talked about this before, but the, um, the apparent visible measurable traits that people have, which are genetically mediated and which are associated with um, explaining why genes put people at risk for um, psychological conditions are called phenotypes. And in the context of substance use, it seems like most of the genetic risk for substance use disorders is operating through personality phenotypes. So one of the biggest ones is the tendency to be impulsive and to be drawn towards risk-taking or sensation-seeking. Another genetic phenotype related to personality has to do with having a tendency towards engaging in more risky, self-destructive, or antisocial behavior, which is also known as externalizing. Another genetic phenotype associated with liability to alcohol use, or sorry, I keep saying alcohol, to substance use disorder is internalizing, or the liability to anxiety, mood, substance, or psychotic disorders, basically just general liability to psychopathology. Another phenotype that mediates the relationship between genetic risk and substance use disorder is, to some extent, um, individual differences which are genetically mediated and how the central nervous system processes and responds to certain substances. So substance use disorder is partly heritable through the heritability of genetically mediated personality and psychopathology predisposing factors that are not specific to substance use disorder. So, Internalizing um, predisposition kind of captures predisposition to most of the disorders that we've talked about in this class. The predisposition to anxiety and mood disorders, the predisposition to developing post-traumatic stress disorder after a trauma, the predisposition to um, clustered 
a, really A, B, and C personality disorders. Externalizing is also a more general psychopathology risk trait, but it's the types of psychopathology most associated with externalizing are substance use, as well as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and cluster B personality disorders, like antisocial and borderline personality disorders in particular. An example of heritability of substance use disorder risk, or in this case, actually protection um, through genetically mediated physiological responses to substances. Um, this example is the ALDH2 mutation, which is a gene that encodes for an enzyme in the liver that is responsible for metabolizing and breaking down ethanol. Um, people that have this particular mutation of this gene have enzymes in their liver that are not as good at metabolizing and breaking down the toxic byproducts of alcohol and flushing them out of their bodies. This genetic mutation is a lot more common in East Asian populations. So people um, from like China, Japan, and Korea, about 50% of people um, whose family origins are in those areas have this trait, which is also sometimes called the Asian flush or the Asian glow. So the behavioral and physiological, or sorry, the um, consequence of having this trait is that when you drink alcohol, it has a more unpleasant toxic effect on your body than it does for most people at lower doses. It causes flushing, shortness of breath, nausea, and headache after just one or two drinks. So understandably, people who have this physical response to alcohol are protected against alcohol use disorder because alcohol drinking tends to be unpleasant and less rewarding. On the flip side, this figure comes from a study design known as the Sons of Alcoholics study design. I think this particular study did only look at men, but more broadly, these study designs look at the um, physiology, behaviors, and traits of children of parents with alcohol use disorder who don't have alcohol use disorder themselves. So they have the phenotype, the genetically mediated risk traits, but they don't have the actual clinical behavior. So in this study, sons of alcoholics were compared to um, children whose parents were not people with alcohol use disorder. And they were given um, a dose of alcohol in the lab. And then their cortisol suppression response to that alcohol was measured um, at 30 minute intervals after alcohol administration. And what we can see here is that um, the children of parents with alcohol use disorder in the green line experienced stronger and faster suppression of cortisol production by alcohol than people who don't have the phenotype for alcoholism. And what this is doing is basically showing that for people that have genetic risk for alcohol use, alcohol actually has more positive, pleasant effects on the body um, than for people who don't have this genetic, um, this phenotype, this genetically mediated risk trait. So I'm not gonna really talk about um, the environmental risk factors that much in this lecture. In the first lecture on substance use disorders, I talked a lot about how the availability of a substance and cultural attitudes about the effect of that substance with a focus on alcohol um, is very closely associated with the prevalence of use and abuse of that substance. The homework reading is going to ask you to think about the role of economic marginality and um, as a broad factor and then a more specific factor the loss of social cohesion and community um, as a risk, a environmental predisposing factor to substance use disorder. The article you're gonna be reading is about the 80s crack panic and the effect of over-policing and mandatory minimum sentencing on black communities like Kensington and Philadelphia, my hometown. Um, but I also want you to think about the readings on the opioid crisis and deaths of despair um, among white working class rural people in places like West Virginia as you're reading this article. Okay. So that was kind of a quick overview of some of the um, personality and physiological predisposing factors to substance use disorder. But internalizing, externalizing, impulsivity, these are really broad, common traits. So not everyone with these personality traits is equally at risk for developing substance use disorder. So, we're going to talk about two factors involved in the precipitation of substance use and the development of potential disordered use, expectancies and social comparisons. So think about your own perceptions about what happens to you when you use these substances if you use them or what happens to people who you know who use them. 
Do you think that drinking alcohol is relaxing, that it relieves anxiety? Do you think that drinking alcohol makes you more fun and outgoing? Does it enhance the enjoyment that you have of social events? Or do you think it makes you more aggressive and emotional? Thinking about THC, so smoking pot or eating edibles, do you think it relaxes you and soothes anxiety? Do you do it to relieve pain and nausea? Do you do it to make food, sex, and comedy more enjoyable? Or do you think that doing these things can make you feel anxious and paranoid or make you act like weird and awkward in social settings? All of these are examples of expectancies that people may have about the effect of these two substances on their bodies and on their behavior. Basically, expectancies are your cognitive attributions about the effects that substances will have on you. Expectancies interact with and actually mediate the effect of risk factors on people's substance use behavior. So for example, the protective effects of the aging glow are really mediated by expectancies. It's not just that people with this genotype don't drink alcohol because uh, their liver doesn't break it down properly. They don't drink alcohol because their liver doesn't break it down properly. And that makes them have the expectation that when they drink alcohol in the future, it'll make them feel sick. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go over how expectancies interact with these different personality risk factors, um, internalizing or negative affect proneness, externalizing or antisociality and impulsivity and sensation seeking. So again, people don't have increased risk for substances just because they have a tendency towards negative affect. They have increased risk for substance use disorder because they have a tendency towards negative affect plus a belief that they develop either through modeling, through exposure to the media, or through personal experience that substances will take away that negative affect and make them feel better. On the other side, people with internalizing or, or sorry, externalizing impulsive or antisocial traits don't use substances because of their personalities. They use substances because they have these personality tendencies, plus a belief that if they're sensation seeking, substances will make those sensations even stronger and more exciting or they'll get rid of uncomfortable boredom, or because they have antisocial traits and believe that substances will make them more powerful, assertive, dominant, or better at hurting and abusing other people. And again, people with the um, Asian flush genetic mutation don't avoid alcohol because their liver can't metabolize it. They avoid alcohol because they believe that drinking alcohol will make them feel sick. And people with genetic risk for alcohol use disorder because of increased cortisol suppression don't drink alcohol because it suppresses their cortisol production. They drink alcohol because they expect drinking alcohol to relieve their stress and anxiety and make them feel better. So in the next slide, I'm gonna have you guys watch a video about the DARE program, the drug abuse um, response education program forget what it stands for, but we all know what D.A.R.E. is. Probably a lot of you had D.A.R.E. classes in school even. D.A.R.E. started as an anti-drug um, ad campaign program in the 80s and 90s, and it basically was an attempt to scare kids away from using drugs by acting on their expectancies. So the goal was to change people's expectancies about what would happen when they use drugs to make them less likely to initiate, to start using drugs, to try it in the first place. Unfortunately, as the video will talk about, this approach really backfired because D.A.R.E. tried to create these incredibly strong, scary, really, really negative expectancies about what drugs would do and what it would feel like. When kids actually tried drugs or when their peers tried drugs or when kids saw their parents using drugs like alcohol or nicotine, they could easily see that the consequences of use weren't as dramatic and dire as D.A.R.E. expected them to, or as D.A.R.E. led them to believe, as D.A.R.E. tried to change their expectancies to make them think. So when you smoke weed for the first time, when you take your friend's ADHD medication, when you have a couple of drinks of alcohol at a family party, it is not going to fry your brain in the way that D.A.R.E. tried to tell you. So when kids had these experiences, any expectancies that D.A.R.E. had given them were completely disproven by their first initiation experiences. And this actually created new expectancies that were maybe more, um, that, were, that could have been exaggerated and inaccurate in the other direction. That could have led kids to believe that drug use is safer or has fewer consequences than it really does. So the real problem with D.A.R.E. 
And what drug prevention programs have hopefully started to learn is that you can't just scare people away from using drugs by telling them that drugs will fry their brain the very first time they use them. You need to provide accurate, nuanced information about the pros and cons of different substances and help people form accurate expectancies, which in most cases will help them to make rational um, decisions around drugs. And rational decisions around drugs aren't always to never do them. Okay, so here's this video. Share my sound. Okay. Today, Attorney General Jeff Sessions attended a gathering of D.A.R.E., the infamous 80s era anti-drug program that amazingly is still around. D.A.R.E. Was, uh, became fundamental to our success by educating children to the dangers of drug use. I firmly believe that your work saved lives. Sessions, the Rip Van Winkle of the war on drugs, apparently slept through the four-decade losing battle fought with ill-conceived policies like D.A.R.E., a propaganda initiative that dared kids to abstain from drugs, narc on their parents and friends, and follow the lead of teen idol Nancy Just Say No Reagan. I will say no to harmful drugs. I will help my friends say no. I will pledge to stand up for what I know is right. All while blowing billions in taxpayer money. D.A.R.E. was founded in 1983 by LAPD Chief Daryl Gates, who once said that casual drug users, quote, ought to be taken out and shot. We're going to condemn those people who casually use drugs in this nation. But kids could avoid summary execution by studying the D.A.R.E. curriculum. Employing a soccer mom's idea of youth culture, D.A.R.E. used music. Buff and pantless lions. How to resist drugs and violence and react to bullying or any other threat. In rapping straight edge bears. Oh, take it from Yogi doing drugs is gross. You can get in trouble from even one dose. Shockingly, none of this halted the advance of teen drug use. A 2001 Surgeon General report on D.A.R.E. said the program, quote, consistently showed little or no deterrent effect on substance use. But the program wasn't completely ineffective. A number of studies found that D.A.R.E. programs could produce a boomerang effect, resulting in increased teen drug use. The negative publicity eventually caught up with D.A.R.E. Participation declined and federal funding disappeared. D.A.R.E. shifted away from the just say no approach and claims its new programs are more effective but Attorney General Sessions is nostalgic for the old days. The D.A.R.E. team is ready to meet this new challenge, no doubt about it. All right, so there's still kind of mixed um, scientific opinions about why D.A.R.E. may have had this boomerang effect. But one hypothesis definitely is that the D.A.R.E. program made, made the effort to give kids Sorry. really exaggerated catastrophic negative expectancies about what would happen if they used drugs, including telling them things like you'll get addicted from just one dose, or you can fry your brain from just smoking pot one time, or telling them that pot makes people violent and aggressive when demonstrably it does not. So when D.A.R.E. gave them these inaccurate, super negative expectancies, they tried the drugs and their expectancies were violated. There's some evidence to believe that they formed opposing equally inaccurate, but positive expectancies, going from pot is so dangerous that if I smoke it one time, I'll become a drug addled violent fiend to smoking pot is completely safe and fine and there's no negative consequences to it at all. When in fact, the truth is somewhere in the middle and specifically for teenagers smoking pot, the biggest danger is that for kids that have genetic liability to schizophrenia, and who have enough polygenetic risk for schizophrenia that they could develop psychosis, pot can be a precipitating factor. So marijuana is pretty safe for almost everyone, unless you are someone who could develop schizophrenia. Pot could be the predisposing factor that could push you over the edge from having a lot of risk to actually expressing the disorder. So when it comes to pot smoking prevention, um, 
people with genetic predisposition to schizophrenia should really be targeted um, with interventions to try to keep people from smoking pot specifically. Okay, so for this next couple slides, we're gonna switch from expectancies to social comparison, although these two things really interact. So think for yourself about what percentage of college students based on all of your experiences in college, the people that you know, the media that you consume, pop culture, what percentage of college students drink alcohol and what percentage of college students binge drink? The most recent data that we have from 2019 suggests that only around half of college students drink alcohol at all and only about a third of college students engage in binge drinking, which again means drinking um, three to four drinks in a night or any kind of drinking that causes intoxication. So a blood alcohol content above 0.08. So now ask yourself, when a college student is drinking, how many drinks do they have in a single occasion? And how many drinks does the average college student drink on a school night, so Sunday through Wednesday? The normative answer is that on the typical drinking occasion, which for the majority of college students happens Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, the average number of drinks is four um, for males. Females average fewer drinks. And on a typical school night, the average number of drinks is zero or less than one. If you guessed that more than half of college students drank, that more than a third of college students binge drank, and that it's typical to have more than four drinks on a drinking occasion, you may be experiencing the social psychological phenomenon of pluralistic ignorance. Pluralistic ignorance is the tendency to perceive the attitudes and behaviors of other people as more different from our own attitudes and behaviors than they really are. So because of pluralistic ignorance, there's a tendency for college students to overestimate how much their peers drink and how much they use other substances. So what happens is that the majority of college students who drink less than what they think is the group norm believe that they're in the minority. They think that they drink less than their peers. And so they don't really share their own feelings and beliefs or their own actual drinking behaviors with their peers. So this silence contributes to continued pluralistic ignorance to college students continuing to think that the average college student drinks more than they do and that they drink um, more frequently and more drinks in a single occasion. Another example of pluralistic ignorance is when you're in a class and the professor asks if there are any questions and nobody raises their hand you might have a question, but think that everyone else is being quiet because they all know the answers and you'll look silly if you ask a question. What pluralistic ignorance tells us is that it's actually pretty likely that if you have a question, other people have questions too. And all of you are sitting there thinking that everyone else knows what's going on. So social comparison theory is the other kind of precipitating factor in going from trying substances for the first time to developing problematic patterns of use. So social comparison theory suggests that as humans who evolved to live in groups who really care about social acceptance and fitting in, we spend a lot of time comparing ourselves to others, our attitudes and behaviors, because we're motivated to reduce any discrepancies between ourselves and other people. We're motivated to be normal, to be average, to not differ that much from the crowd um, in the majority of ways. This is very normal human behavior, and it's especially normal for adolescents who are in a developmental stage where peer acceptance and modeling their behavior on their peers is developmentally appropriate and normal. So peer group norms, what their friends are doing, dictates a lot of adolescent behavior, including adolescent substance use behavior. So knowing this and knowing that expectancies about drinking can be formed based on witnessing what your peers are doing or beliefs about what your peers are doing, and that those beliefs are often inaccurate and in that they overestimate how common and normative substance use is. More effective primary prevention strategies, so programs that aim to prevent the initiation of problematic substance use, work on pre precipitation by trying to change normative beliefs about what people think is typical or normal use and at the same time by providing accurate, nuanced information about the real effects of substances. Um, these figures show the outcomes, the effectiveness of a normative education feedback program on college student drinking. 
um, since the program was initiated at, I think it's a large Midwestern university. I wanna say University of Iowa. Um, education, so teaching students about what their peers are actually doing and teaching them about the phenomenon of pluralistic ignorance has helped to make students' perceptions of the normative amount of drinking among their peers more accurate. And it's also contributed to reduced drinking behavior in the students who these programs target. And to an increasing number of students reducing their alcohol intake to a more normative zero to four drinks per night or per drinking, drinking occasion. So that is it for this lecture. I'm gonna go on to the next lecture and talk a little bit more about um, perpetuation, long-term perpetuation of substance use and the treatment of substance use disorders.